Right, well I'm Mike Parker Pearson from the Institute of Archaeology at UCL, University College London, and we're here on a splendid day at Wine Mound. Uh, Wine Mound is in the Priscelli Hills of North Pembrokeshire, and as you can see behind me, it's the site of some standing stones. Well, actually only one's still standing, the other three have fallen over. There's one there behind the, this one standing, and you can see another smaller one just poking out of the grass, and there's a fourth one just here uh, uh, behind the camera. Now, these were first recorded by the Royal Commission sometime around the First World War, and they reckoned that these might be part of what had once been a stone circle. Other archaeologists came up here and hummed and hard. One of them was W.F. Grimes, Welsh archaeologist who later became director of the Institute of Archaeology in London, where I work. Uh, Peter Grimes, as his friends called him, wasn't terribly impressed with these. He said, well, could be a circle, but very probably not. And that's where it all uh, was left until 2010, when I came here with a team of archaeologists from various universities after we'd been working in the Stonehenge landscape, excavating at Stonehenge and other sites. And we were interested in the blue stones. How had they got to Stonehenge? Where had they come from? At that point, the geologists Rob Ixer and Richard Bevins were just beginning to identify some of the specific sources of the blue stones here in Priscelli. And we were wondering if they had actually been put up in a monument here before being taken to Stonehenge, if it was effectively the monument that was moved to Stonehenge rather than the individual stones. How else might people have known about these stones if they weren't in some impressive structure? So we looked at this site in 2010, we did some geophysics, they were very disappointing results. We couldn't find any other traces of uh, sockets for, st for stones that had been put up and taken away. So we lost heart and we went off and we looked at other circular things in the landscape over the next, what, six or seven years. Uh, we excavated two of the bluestone sources and discovered that they were indeed megalith quarries. One of them, right behind me, on the hillside there, beneath the plantation on the horizon, that is Khan Goidog. And that is where we think the majority of the spotted dolerite blue stones uh, uh, came from. And then down in the valley, amongst those green fields, there is Craig Rosavellin, where we know that at least one, possibly two of the rhyolite pillars at Stonehenge uh, most pro uh, originated. So, we were interested to see if we could find such a site. We'd, we crossed this one off our list and we looked at all sorts of other circular sites in the, in the area. And they all turned out to be Bronze Age, Iron Age, or even later. Um, what that did though, was force us to come back here. And in 2017 and 2018, we carried out um, further geophysics and trial excavations. For the geophysics, we threw everything at it. Magnetometry, earth resistance survey, magnetic induction, and sorry, electromagnetic induction, and ground penetrating radar. Absolutely nothing. Um, we couldn't understand why the results were so bad until our geophysicists looked at the quality of the sediments. And the difficulty we have on this upland terrain is that this is glacial drift, which is unfortunately neither conductive nor magnetic. So we were effectively wasting our time, but at least we tried it. What we found in 2017 was that by extending, by digging trenches beyond uh, the arc, continuing the, the arc, we found a stone hole um, beyond the, 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 the small stone there, and we found another one beyond the stone just here. And then in 2018, we excavated five 
main areas, uh, main trenches, and what we found was a further um, four stone sockets. So we had six, uh, four stones still here, six stones been put up but removed. The question was where and when had they gone? Now, we knew that one of the difficult things to do with a stone circle like this was to date it. Uh, first of all, let's say a bit about the dimensions, because although its dimensions as a possible circle had been estimated first by the Royal Commission and then by Grimes, neither had realized that it was quite as big as it actually is, because we were able to pick up some of those stone sockets over there. Its diameter is a stunning 110 meters. That makes it the third largest stone circle in Britain. Avebury is easily the biggest, 330 meters. Coming in second is Stanton Drew in Somerset at 113. And then third is here, Wine Mound. So it's the largest stone circle in Wales. And uh, it also, intriguingly, has exactly the same diameter as the encircling ditch around Stonehenge. Now, a question that's really important is what date is it? Most stone circles that can be, uh, have been dated date to after Stonehenge. So sometime after Stonehenge's first phase at 3000 BC. So uh, could we show whether it was earlier than Stonehenge? In other words, might it be possible that the reason there are so few stones here is because they were taken away to Stonehenge? Or were we going to discover that actually it was built after Stonehenge's first stage and that when the blue stones were first put up there? So, two classic ways of dating in archaeology. The first is well known and it is radiocarbon dating. Now, in this acidic landscape, there's very little old carbon left in archaeological deposits. Bone and antler just don't survive. So you're thrown back on dating charcoal, because charcoal isn't destroyed in the uh, acidic soils. Now, we've dated our quarry sites with charcoal, Unfortunately, people in the Neolithic had been lighting fires in those locations so we could get reasonably sized pieces from their contexts so they could, we knew that they could date the context reasonably well. Here is a different matter because although there was charcoal in the stone sockets, it was very, very small. And that presents us with a problem because small stuff easily gets incorporated into later features. So if it's lying about the surface and someone digs a hole and fills it back in, the stuff that was in the turf line and so on, that, that's going to go back into the hole. Also, small stuff moves down the soil profile thanks to the action of earthworms. And amazingly, we found quite a lot of earthworms up here in these very uh, uh, difficult, uh, in this very sparse uh, vegetation. So that meant that we couldn't rely absolutely on the radiocarbon dates. They could give us a guide, but we had to be aware of residuality, in other words, much earlier stuff, and contamination, much later stuff. So we decided to use a second technique as well. And this is called optically stimulated luminescence. And this is a method where you extract sediment in complete darkness by hammering cores into the side of your, so of your stone socket. And then on extraction, in laboratory conditions, you open them up with under infrared lighting and you select out grains of quartz. Those grains of quartz are then fired at with a laser, which releases the remnant energy since they were last exposed to light. And just like radiocarbon, you can get a plus or minus, a probability range, 
for each of your samples. We were able to date, what, about five of the different stone sockets, and the dates were all consistent, and they basically ranged from about 3,800 BC to 3,200 BC. So in other words, that's a good 200 years at the very latest before Stonehenge. Now, the radiocarbon dates we got, as we expected, the vast majority were Mesolithic. So these are from a landscape that was presumably being cleared in the millennia before the arrival of farmers and agriculture at 4000 BC. And then we had, what, four Neolithic radiocarbon dates, uh, broadly from about 36 to 3000 BC. And then nothing a complete blank in dates for the next thousand years. Now that's interesting because it's broadly in those next thousand years that it seems that most of Britain's stone circles were built in the late Neolithic into the early Bronze Age. Now that established that yes, the circle was put up very possibly before 3200 BC, but probably not much earlier than that. Uh, that makes it quite possibly the earliest stone circle in Britain. There's one in Cumbria called Long Meg and Her Daughters, which has an equivalently early radiocarbon date, so uh, maybe it's its first equals in terms of date. The big question then, though then is, can we date when they removed the stones? And it's, a, it's more difficult because you can't date a removal, because you're dating a void. All you can do is date sediment in the emptied socket that has later accumulated after the stone has gone. And the great thing about these features was that we could see the imprints of the sockets extremely clearly. These great big heavy stones had actually made a kind of uh, an imprint of their bottoms in the pits. So we could actually see exactly what sort of size and shape the base of the stone had been. So the sediment that accumulated in them, the OSL dating uh, showed that this had to happen sometime before 2000 BC, plus or minus a few hundred years. In other words, before the Bronze Age. So, since the Neolithic is before the Bronze Age, I think there's a very good chance that these stones were removed to go to Stonehenge. Uh, we have one radiocarbon date that comes from one of these, um, uh, from, from the, the fill of, one, of, the, of an empty stock, socket, and interestingly enough, that is right on 3000 BC, the very time that we know at Stonehenge that the Aubrey holes were used, were, were, were constructed, and it is in those Aubrey holes that we are now convinced that the blue stones were first put up. So we're very excited about this because effectively we have the site, the important site. Now, what other features are there? Well, the stones that we're looking at that were left behind are all of unspotted dolerite. And that's one of the less common ones at Stonehenge. So all, out of the 43 uh, blue stones from Priscelli, um, only three are of unspotted, and somewhere around 20, 28 or so are of the spotted dolerite. Uh, we were looking for chippings in the sockets, and one of them, right over in the far side of the circle, produced um, chippings, lots of them, and these are of unspotted dolerite just like these. We also had the basal imprint of the stone, and it compares very closely in size and shape to one of the uprights at Stonehenge. I think it's Stone 62. So it's just possible that that stone originally stood over there. So how, how do we find out if there's a match? And of course, you know, the obvious thing would be to do a plaster cast. These days, you can do a plaster cast electronically. We have uh, machines that uh, basically, um, what are they called, laser scanners. 
and of course they will produce an image and you can also do that very effectively with um, uh, three-dimensional photography so that you uh, what's called structure from motion you can take pictures from many different angles above below from the side and so on and then build a three-dimensional model of the impression um, so that's been that's been a very useful technique now other aspects about the circle that are interesting is that um, over there the, the small lying down stone um, it's, it's odd because it's quite small, but also when we found the socket next to it where it originally stood, uh, the socket was actually aligned perpendicular to the arc of the circle, pointing, so the stone would have been put up actually pointing that way. So like a gun sight effectively. And then 15 meters further round, there was another such socket. And these two sockets had that, and, and, uh, characteristic we didn't see in any of the others that they're basically forming a gun site in that direction and uh, we were lucky to be able to have on our team uh, Professor Clive Ruggles who is the specialist in archaeoastronomy the world expert and Clive was able to say yes of course you can guess what direction lies beyond that is from the center of the circle midsummer solstice sunrise and there's another famous circle the same diameter the Stonehenge ditch and the Stonehenge has its orientation similarly towards midsummer solstice sunrise so the fact that they share the same size the fact that they have the same uh, 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 solstitial alignment suggests that there must have been an intimate connection between these two monuments, this one coming before Stonehenge. Um, it's becoming less and less likely that that's coincidence, that here we are in the land of the blue stones. Um, the question now remaining though is, well, how many stones were there? And that's going to require more excavation. It looks like we've got gaps. So although we found a stone socket over here, there's a gap where there seemed to have been none. Now, this is in fact quite regular with other stone circles in Britain. The one I've mentioned, Stanton Drew, uh, another big circle in Scotland, the Ring of Brodgar on Orkney. Um, there are often substantial gaps at various points. So it's possible that um, it's just a gappy circle. The other possibility is that it may never have been completed. And that raises intriguing possibilities. Uh, also, we haven't got any trace of uh, stone types other than the unspotted dolerite. And given that we've got spotted dolerite up there, rhyolite down there, and somewhere in that area, the various other Stonehenge bluestones, the volcanics, the sandstones, and so on, um, the possibility is twofold. If this didn't hold all of the stones, might there be a second stone circle? Because don't forget, uh, during our excavations at Stonehenge, we found a second unknown stone circle down at the end of the Stonehenge Avenue beside the River Avon that we called Blue Stonehenge, which had held some 25 or so blue stones uh, at the same time as the 56 in Stonehenge. So there is the possibility that there are more circles to be found. Um, Bevins and Ix's recent work on the, um, the altar stone at Stonehenge has revealed that whilst it comes from Wales, it doesn't come from Pembrokeshire. It's actually from another county altogether, just inside Powys. And um, what they've discovered is that it can be matched broadly to the, the old red sand, the Devonian sandstones that we get in the area of Crickhowell, Crickhowell and Abergavenny. So that suggests that it's very possible that this wasn't the only source for Stonehenge's blue stones, that actually they were accumulating quite probably from a number of monuments that extended as far as uh, Crickhowell. Uh, the other intriguing possibility is that our dates for quarrying, particularly those at Kangoidog, 
they, the quarrying ends in exactly the same century as the bluestones go up at Stonehenge. So I'm wondering about another possibility, which is that while some of the stones may have come from this and maybe other stone circles, others may have actually come direct from the quarry. That they were contributing not just from existing monuments, but also from quarries. So let's get on to the big question. Why? We've talked a bit about the, the basics of how you do it and all. There's lots of interest about how they move them. And we're now wondering that since we're the north side of Preseli, it's not an easy route to go over the mountain and all the way down to Milford Haven. The fact that the altar stone is on the way along the A40 makes me wonder whether they were actually taking these as far as possible by land. Um, and it's a massive undertaking. This would have involved not just the communities here, but people all along the way. This would have been years of preparation, not just the ropes, uh, the food, uh, but also clearing the route, actually making a, a viable route to, to, to drag the stones. And of course, recruiting a labor force of thousands. Yeah, from my own experience working in megalith building societies like Madagascar, the problem is not enough people, the problem's too many people, because everybody wants to be part of it. So what's going on in Britain in the 30th century BC that makes them do this extraordinary thing? And I think one of the things that's really interesting is that Stonehenge's location uh, in that part of Salisbury Plain, that was already a major focus of monuments and ceremonial gatherings. Um, and it's one of several that run basically north to south from the Thames Valley to the south coast. And uh, uh, in, those, in the, those earlier centuries, it seems to have been on something of a, a cultural watershed. To the west, you've got people using different pottery types to those to the east. And there are variations in the tomb types as well so that Long Barrows are, are, are more an Eastern English thing, whereas Dolmens we find in the Southwest as, uh, as well as in Wales. So um, it may have actually been on a political boundary between territorial groups. And you know, the, the whole point, I think, of actually bringing stones from here in one way would actually serve to coalesce um, that what would have been different cultural groupings. We're getting some very interesting new results from ancient DNA, which shows that there are differences in the, um, uh, uh, in the DNA of people in the Neolithic living in Wales to people living in southeast England. Yes, so on a gorgeous afternoon like this, it's hard to remember just how bad it was. When we packed up in 2018, we were uh, facing 55 mile an hour winds and driving rain. It was like trying to work on the surface of some, uh, some uh, planet in a distant part of the galaxy. Uh, it was certainly not Earth as I recall it. <laughs>